Welcome to the Spotlight with Sean O'Rourke. I'm back this week with Stu. We're going to be talking about Star Wars, lots of Star Wars. We got Swamp Thing on the agenda, dropping some stuff on Avatar, CBS All Access, rebranding itself, Tom Cruise in space. Are you kidding me? Let's get right into it. Okay, so Tom Cruise in space. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. I mean, the guy has proven over and over and over again in all of his movies that he just keeps pushing the envelope. Uh, and it's weird because he didn't always do this. Yeah. It kind of started, uh, uh, you know, there was one movie I think that like, I mean, I know he kind of got the air, the, the fly in the airplane thing bug from top gun and he did get his pilot's license, you know, to fly fixed wings. But it's like every time he was doing a Mission Impossible movie, he just felt he had to up the ante. Yeah. And uh, wh what are some of the big stunts that he's done? The climb in the building in Dubai, like the tallest building. Uh, climb in the, yeah. That was, and that's some scary stuff. When you see him running down the yeah. building, that's really his legs. That's like, you can, you could tell that's Tom right. Cruise. The hanging on the side uh, of the galaxy plane or whatever. The plane, yeah. right, right, right. And then I saw the behind the scenes where they had to put like contact lenses in his eyes because it at 300 miles an hour, when it started to bank, you know, it would pull all, it would dry out his eye sockets right. and everything. I mean, oh my God. And the G forces and all that stuff. All right. Then he really did do the jump out the of halo. the plane. High altitude. The halo opening. jump. Yeah. High altitude. Uh, uh, he probably didn't have a low opening. He just did a high altitude. Yeah, that's jump. true. Yeah, I guarantee he didn't do <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that because you saw how that ended, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, he had to grab uh, what's his name, who was unconscious. That was a Henry great Cavill. scene. I love the lightning hit where mm. everything goes silent. Like you know, if really, oh, if yeah. you were concussed or something and you couldn't hear anything, I thought that was cool. Yeah, no, that was great. Um, then uh, what is the other crazy shit that he's done? The holding his breath for like seven or eight minutes underwater for that one scene. <laughs> he had he trained to be a free diver. Yeah. In order to do that, and so learn to and then learn to fly a helicopter. Learn to fly a helicopter for mission, the last Mission Impossible. Then he gets in the F eighteen Hornets for Top Gun two, which looks amazing. Yeah. The behind yeah. the scenes. So now he wants to team up with. Um, SpaceX, NASA, and Elon Musk and shoot a movie in space. Now it's in development, so no one knows what the hell this thing is, but I guarantee it'll take place on the on the International Space Station. A murder mystery, maybe, on the International Space Station? Something? I feel like it'll be more like something like Gravity or something crazy like that, where it'll be like him in an intense situation in space, you know? And it's interesting because... I mean, of course Tom Cruise would do that. Like, he's done everything else. And, I mean, I, I've said this before, too, when we've talked about him, is I really honestly feel like he is trying to be the character in real life. Like, he's trying to be that character to the best of his ability. Well, he's going all, like, it's like method. Right, ultra. <laughs> but ultra psychotic <laughs> method acting where you just take it to the umpteenth level. And, um, you know, or, like, with the Scientology... He's, you know, when you get to the beta, theta, whatever levels that you go up, <laughs> right. uh, you finally, the end game, when you die, you get a planet. Right. And I think maybe he wants to see what Earth looks like from space because he probably wants to claim Earth as his planet, <laughs> unless they give him something else. Who knows um, with him? All I, all I know is that Tom Cruise delivers it every yeah. time. He's one of the best actors of our generation. And... On a, on an acting note alone, this guy never blinks, okay? Watch him in a scene, his eyes almost never <laughs> blink. And that is a trick that actors have to learn because, you know, you don't want on a big, giant, 18-foot screen, a, a giant eye smacking up and down and fluttering all the right. time, What which is kind of what we do in real life. You have to learn to control your eye for intensity and stuff. And Tom Cruise is the king of controlling his eyeballs uh, uh, on screen. I'm sorry, there's no other actor except maybe Michael Caine that does it better. Right. Period. He, Tom Cruise and Michael Caine. He's, I mean, he's definitely an intense actor and an amazing actor. Like, I don't care about his 
crazy Scientology thing. Like I doubt I'll ever be friends or I, I will never be friends with Tom Cruise in real life. Um, but who cares? Like the guy, you never know, man, he might hear this interview no. and be like, dude, I, excuse got, my that friend. guy's too busy trying to get to space to watch YouTube. So <laughs> I understand, but I mean, it's like, I'm not trying to be his buddy. I just appreciate his work and he does really good work. So a really good yeah. work. And I, I think even the, even his worst enemies would say, eh, yeah, but his movies are good. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, well, really. it's funny. Cause I feel like this all stemmed from like his trying to like one up every movie is there was like a, I'm pretty sure this was Mark Wahlberg kind of came down on him. Cause he said, making movies is like going to war. And then, of course, uh, I think this was right around, uh, you know, when Mark Wahlberg was doing all those war movies and dealing with SEALs in real life and shit like that. Right. And, right. like, he came down on Tom Cruise, like, that's bullshit. Like, that's that Hollywood. And I feel like Tom Cruise, like, because I remember he responded, like, come on, man. You know, you know what I mean? But I do think ever since then, it's like he's been trying to be like, I'll show that motherfucker. <laughs> and he's just been... <laughs> Like trying to be the character. He's like, you might be acting, but I'm living this shit. <laughs> like, I really think yeah. that's what he's trying to do. I'd love I'd love to see Mark Wahlberg run across, you know, in that building in Dubai, run across the glass yeah. and swing from one. And I'd just love to see it. He might do you it, know? man. I mean, I, I again, Mark Wahlberg, he's, you know, from boston and all that so and i don't think he grew up in a he's tough but yeah he's tough i don't think so. i don't think he's got nah, stunt double i don't think he's crazy enough to do what tom cruise does but i mean mm -mm, mm -mm. but again i haven't seen really a bad tom cruise movie i saw the happening and i know exactly where mark Wahlberg lands in that scenario because that was the worst performance i've ever seen out of an actor was in the happening do you remember that movie it was one of m night Sh that's the one that was M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong's movie with the the trees attacking people with yes. pollen. You know what, dude? I think it's amazing because, oh. you know, who knows? The, the, when you look at what's going on with COVID-19, the earth sometimes will reclaim, shake the fleas off. Well, I'm not even saying I, that I, that's I, a bad idea. I'm saying his acting was performance. horrible. Right. And that was like the first time like I really saw where a director can make or break an actor. Because... Mark Wahlberg, Wahlberg has done great sh stuff. You know, I've seen him in movies where he's been really impressive, but you can tell when you're not really he 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 needs he needs Peter Berg. Yeah, well, Peter Berg is like Michael Bay light. And he needs Michael Bay, <laughs> yeah. Michael yeah. Bay light. Yeah, no, he need he needs yeah, but he also stays in his lane too. Yeah, so I mean, it's because I can't see I can't see Mark Wahlberg doing, um, uh. You know, w the movie with uh, Jack Nicholson, um, A Few Good Men. Oh, yeah. I can't see him playing the Tom Cruise role. I mean, he don't have the not skill. Not many people could pull that off. Like, the, with the intensity. No, I'm, not th I'm, I'm talking about the, the Tom Cruise. Yeah, role. no, I mean, not many people could pull off that yeah. intensity that he did, especially in that scene, like the end scene with him and Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Great. Going toe to toe. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't see it happening. Yeah. But you know what? But Mark Wahlberg does great with Alan Arkin. Yeah. Well, and also a good director. Like, and I feel like this is a good example because if you're an amazing actor, even if you have a shit director, you can work your way through it. But I feel like M. Night was lacking in some department because if I was Mark Wahlberg, I would be pissed that he made him look stupid in that because he really looked like he didn't know how to act in that movie. And yeah. that was like, yeah. aside from this, you know the concept of it being like wind killing everyone, the pollen or whatever, but just his performance was just right. And I think he even knows that, but again, it's like the actors are, are relying on the director. Like, you know, they don't know, they don't see what's on the monitor. They just kind of think you must see the vision or you must see it. So I'm trusting you to make me look good. And then we also don't know if anything behind the scenes went on where like they butted heads. So then he gave him a dry performance. That could be it as well. Could have happened. Could have. That's happened. like one guy who, where they say you're only as good as your last movie. Then how the fuck is that guy still making movies? I'll never get it. I'll never get it. Like he had two good movies. We we th and he he had an opportunity with Glass yeah. to really bring that home. After everybody was begging for a sequel. Yeah. You know, and it finally came to fruition, and it 
wasn't that good. He M knighted it's it shame. all up. He M knighted it up. Shamalama ding dong. I mean, it's just uh, he ruined. It. Like he that was because I mean, obviously everyone loves his first movie, and then you know, Signs was good, and then Unbreakable is good, and then you it was really great that twist at the end of the movie where you find out that that world is connected, and then we got Glass, which could have been a great setup, and then they just could have been a great setup. And then they just said, nah, I don't really feel like doing that. <laughs> as, as a trilogy, it would have been so amazing. Yeah. But they screwed up the third act. Oh. The third act oh. is always shit. <laughs> that's Sean that's, Connery's that's agent right. says. Um, so uh, the Mandalorian uh, episode two aired for the, uh, the gallery, Disney gallery. Mm -hmm. And they had the round table with all the directors. Yeah. Some amazing stuff came out of that. And uh, uh, you wanted to talk about what Dave Filoni said. Oh, dude, that guy, legend. Like, I consider myself a, you know, a casual Star Wars fan. I'm not in it, like, where I know everything that happened. I grew up with the, the original trilogy, so I love those movies. But, man, no, I mean, no one should ever even try to get in competition with Dave Filoni when it comes to Star Wars because that guy knows his shit. And just listening to him talk about the the duel of fates and how episode one really matters to the whole like six films was insane the way he broke that down. And I was like, when he was done, I was just like, my God, that's totally what happened. And he says, I can trace a line from that film all the way to return of the Jedi. And it's true. And so I'm glad he's you know, not, not having a, not having a father and then, right. uh, um, you know, having Qui Gon taken away from right. him, and then even though Obi Wan was training him, he was more of a brother. He never had right. the father. Then when he swore he would protect his mother, he went back, and his mother died. And it's just it follows the whole father son thing throughout the entire. Uh, uh, and at what was what 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 really stuck out to me in that particular video, and I don't know whether it was creative editing where they cut him off and cut to something else, but he said that one to six right is star wars to him right and i was like ooh, yeah. ooh. uh and but you got to remember you know george found him and the, the one of the other episodes they talked about how george you know found dave filoni and i had been familiar with dave for a long time um throughout all of the clone mm -hmm. wars and and star wars rebels and all that. and i always knew he was an ace in a hole uh with george uh lucas and um uh, and to, you know, to see this guy finally directing live action and to learn everything that he learned in order to do what he's doing, um, uh, something that, you know, a lot of breaking news has happened in the last week with, when it comes to star Wars. So you, you got, uh, Tamora Morrison who played Django Fett and the clones in yep. the, the original prequel trilogy is coming back to play what, they're saying is Boba Fett, but something in my heart is telling me he's playing Commander Rex because if you followed the last, you know, four episodes of the Clone Wars, you know, he was the only clone that had the chip removed that didn't execute Order 66 right. and start killing Jedis. And he basically runs off with Ahsoka Tana at the end. Uh, and it just, when you hear that Rosario Dawson got cast as, as, uh, um, in a cameo that'll be in the Mandalorian. Uh, and of course, Tamora Morrison is going to be in the Mandalorian. Some people are like, well, he could be Boba Fett and he could be Commander Rex and both of them could be in it. I'm not thinking Boba Fett. Um, uh, I'm thinking Commander Rex. And then uh, a, a WWE wrestler by the name of Sasha Banks was cast as uh, Sabin Wren. Mm. Uh, I think I'm saying her name right. And I remember, I remember, I got to go back and watch the Clone Wars. So she's one of the characters in the Clone Wars that's in the ship, the ghost, and she used to be a Mandalorian or has the Mandalorian armor and so on and so on. And they cast her. And so something that just, you know, I'm starting to put the pieces together. Now, right. the rumor is they're just, just going to be cameos in the next season of Mandalorian. And then... um, uh. What what's being told to the public is that their live action counterparts will be on the Mandalorian for a cameo. Then it will lead into seize another season of Star Wars Rebels CGI, mm -hmm. 
and I think that's kind of a cop yeah. out. Like that's like that's like putting the tip in, huh. and that's it, and then pulling well, out, right? Like I you, never you're watched. Them, you're giving everybody what what you wanted, but and that's the thing. I'm gonna challenge. You, I want to challenge you to watch the Clone Wars. Just watch the first episode of the CGI, the or not the Clone Wars, the Rebels, Star Wars right. Rebels, because that is important. Because the the Rebels ship, the Ghost, was in the fight at Scarrick. In Rogue One, they showed it in the background, right. fighting. Like they all show up at a hyperspace, and you're like, "Oh, that's the ghost!" And the ghost was also in the last shot in Rise of the Skywalker when all the ships like hover and like float in from hyperspace. So, the crew of the ghost, who are from Star Wars Rebels, are are moving on. Like they've they've got so much story because they've they went through everything and either hid and was out there somewhere in the galaxy. And that's why I think, uh, Taika, Watiti, I think he's doing rebels as a feature film. Oh, that would, that's my hypothesis. I mean, that would make sense. Sort of. That's what we've said that they might be doing with Disney plus is sort of using that to begin origins or, you know, set the, like get the audience used to these characters and then springboard them into features which would make sense, like like with the MCU. That's like right. you know, Winter Soldier, Falcon. Right. You can introduce just... new 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 comic book characters in those series and then launch them to their own movies. Right. So I mean, I kind of feel like this makes sense if they're doing that, or the lady that was that did Russian Doll. If they're gonna do her series and then they make a you know a series about her Asaka. character, yeah. Ahsoka Tana, yeah. But for yeah. me, it's like I've never watched the Clone Wars or Rebels or any of that. And I do feel like you'll have a lot of people like me who are fans of the films but never watched the cartoon or animation or whatever it is. But And so that's the thing that I find weird if they do, you know, have them show up in Mandalorian Season 2 and then just to set them up for another season of Rebels... I mean, I don't know how likely someone that's just really into the live action stuff is going to go carry over and watch Rebels from that. Well, I mean, this is this is again, it's a shift to go to Disney Plus to buy Disney Plus. I mean, that's what and then you can go back and watch every single Clone Wars. You could watch every single, you know, there's seven seasons of Clone Wars or, you know, you can go back and watch all the seasons of Rebels. I mean, it's like the it's a marketing thing. I think it's marketing, but I, I would be like Os Rosario Dawson needs an Osaka Tana film. Now, at the end of Rise of Skywalker, her voice was one of the voices telling Ray to rise. Uh, okay. Osaka Tana. Now, I don't know if it was the animated version of Osaka Tana's voice. voice. Yeah. I don't think they used Rosaria Dawson. But my point is, if that's the case, then Osaka Tana was dead. Yeah. Talking to her from the spirit world. So at some point, even if you brought her into some feature films, you could use her for a certain amount of time, but then she ultimately would have to die. Yeah, I mean, because she wouldn't be involved in any of the other stuff. I would think they would use like because again, if you're just gonna have them show up as live in live action only for cameos and then go off and do a Rebels animated series, why not just use the real voice actors? Because the lady that did the Osaka Tana, I mean, she looks like she if you put her in the makeup, she could pull off that character. She would look just like, and it. I yeah, think the totally. fans would really want that, you know. So I. Uh, I'm. I feel like. But it, the fans also lobbied. They did a whole, you know, for Rosario Dawson vote thing for Rosario Dawson, and then some of the images that people have fan mm. images that people created. She looks amazing yeah, in yeah. the role. So I. I mean, I don't. I'm know. not saying she's know. not going to be amazing. I just think from a if they were just going to use them as a cartoon setup, I don't feel like they would have cast all these characters with these actors. I feel like they would have used the voice talent, and then that would have been it. So I think you're right. I think. The uh, Takeda movie that would be that would make sense if that was what his Star Wars film was going to be. I don't know why they've given up on the uh, Knights of the Old Republic, you know, because I feel like that all fizzled out when the Game of Thrones guys bounced. But I mean, I really want to well, see well, that. I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, I think so too. I, I think maybe they're just waiting for the right people to come along that that could tackle that. Yeah. I mean, there's um, talented filmmakers in Hollywood, just not Ryan Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, uh, Sam Witwer, who played Darth Maul, you know, has been very vocal lately, you know, talking about, you know, I don't think Ryan Johnson did his homework when he did his film. I and agree. I agree with him. And a lot, a lot of people are not agreeing with that. And, uh, you know, 
But again, it goes back to something you've always said is like, why would Lucasfilm not use the, like when it can't, why, why they let that movie get to that yeah. point where it just kind of threw everything out unless they had orders from up above Kathleen Kennedy that said, we're going in a different direction. Well, it was funny. Kathleen Kennedy was in the gallery yeah. And uh Briefly. you know, and she was when they were filming behind the scenes of the Mandalorian, you saw her sitting in Video Village with Lucas and with everyone. So look, she's in the mouse house. Things are going right now. Yeah. Everybody's happy. The fans are rallying behind all this new stuff. I don't know. Yeah. I I think well, especially like again going back to the um Dave Filoni thing, when you watch that guy, you're I mean, I can't see after hearing that, you know, how they wrapped up that episode or episode two of the gallery. Why is that guy not in charge of Star Wars? Like he clearly has a connection and he and what I loved most about it, he goes, this isn't my story. This is George Lucas's story. And, you know, I'm just here to serve that story in a way. So it's like, yes, like exactly. And so why if you have this guy who was there when had George Lucas explaining all this stuff to him? you know, was there with the prequels, you know, like helping learn about all that and really getting inside his head. Why would you not put that guy in charge of the story group? Because at least as an advisor, so when they want to do like wonky shit, like have Leia fly through space, like Mary Poppins be like, well, I don't know, you know, that might've been done in this, but you know, it's like someone to kind of keep it on track again. Like when you can break down like the, the fight and you know because duel of fates was that rig the original name for the movie i know it's the score piece for that scene the score for that for the it's phantom duel menace is the duel duel of the fates and you know that was the going to be the title that mark or uh, that colin trevorrow's uh, film that he got let go and his script that leaked was the duel of the fates oh uh, okay so so i mean that was, does you know right well, that probably would have been a better movie if ryan johnson didn't gum up the works but Again, I, I blame Kathleen, but Kathleen Kennedy, but I did watch that, the director and the Jedi or whatever thing. Oh, you did watch that. Was, and how, how did Disney think that releasing that was going to somehow fortify Ryan Johnson's position as a good director? It made him look so green. It did it make him like they were just like he was overwhelmed. It looked like they were just overwhelmed. It looked like they were, uh, and then just like the way they treated, um, uh, Mark Hamill like a donkey, a wet donkey beating a wet donkey. Just yeah. I don't know, man. It just put a bad taste in my mouth. And as an actor, it just looked like they were just really like, we don't care what you think. You're getting paid. You showed up. You signed the contract. Do your job and go home. That's kind of how it seemed like they treated him. Well, it definitely, it definitely seemed like he was in over his head. And I feel like the problem with him writing it is one of the things that was very apparent was how like crazy their schedule was. And how they were basically saying, if we miss one thing, this whole thing falls apart. And it was because Ryan Johnson had written in so many different locations that they had to build all these sets and they had all these different things that, again, I don't know if he just thought like, oh, it's Star Wars money, so I can just write everything. And then when it came proof to pull it off, it's like, oh, we kind of screwed ourselves. Because if you watch the other films, they have locations, but they are really confined, like the especially the original trilogy, you know, like... There was a lot of scenes on the uh, on the Millennium Falcon and Empire Strikes Back. You know, you you have a lot on the on the uh, on the Imperial ships, and then on the Millennium Falcon, and then the you know Yoda world. You're the Dagobah or whatever. Dagobah, and then yeah. Hoth, and then that's not really much. And then Cloud City. So you don't really have a shit ton of locations when you think about it. Right. And they're just you know moving around in there. So. I don't know. I mean, I think again, like, and then when you, I get frustrated about the stupid uh, casino planet stuff because how massive that set was. Canto bite. And right, how right. how much like literally budget and effort and time went to that. Went into a sequence that just sucked. That really yeah. didn't serve the story. It didn't make it. Did not serve. It, it the really story. didn't do anything other than that they got double crossed in the end. Like, it really just served, didn't serve the story at all. And it seemed like it just a thing to add, sort of inject some sort of political thing in there. And I, and then I hate the little decoder ring where the, the, the uh, Rose shows like, Oh, we're good. And then like, 
Are they issuing those you out? That never like, showed up in the. They, you know that never showed up in the the la, the Rise of Skywalker, right? Yeah. No one, no one was running around going, "Look at me, I'm part of the resistance." Well, and so yeah. like never. Happened. I don't understand why someone coming in wouldn't go to a Dave Filoni and be like, "Hey, man, I don't want to screw this up, so like help me out with this." Yeah, I can't believe he wasn't consulted. That or his ego, he's like, or we don't. Yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just. I mean, all we can do is like guess and like what might have happened but it's just i mean just looking at the for me the the train wreck that is that movie and what it did for the rest of the the trilogy it's just really a, a bummer and then when you watch dave filoni do that you know how give that uh speech kind of or you know that talk you just like Oh, dude, he he really like he, and I, it was funny because he he said, "Did I ruin the mood? Did I bring yeah. us down?" And they were like, "No, we, you 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 brought us up. You gave us." Well, the directors know, were even then, like, uh, uh, "Yeah, da- uh, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard was like, my hair stood up on my arms, and I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. fantastic stuff." I Maybe mean, have all the directors come in and sit with Dave Filoni and talk for a minute, <laughs> you know, when they get cast, but. I mean, I do think what the biggest problem, and again, this is Kathleen Kennedy's fault, is they seem dead set on not relying on George Lucas for future films. I mean, that's clearly. But yet, you see, you see him in Video Village sitting there next to John Favreau, well, now George Lucas, <laughs> and with, <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, you know, George, uh, one of his big things was he every time he made a new movie, he pushed technology, right. You know, in The Phantom Menace, there was only one scene shot with a digital camera, and that was the scene where Qui-Gon um, took the metachlorian count and talked to Obi-Wan and, you know, pricked, right. basically pricked the finger of Anakin. And Stupid. that was the only movie shot, the only part of the film shot with a digital yeah. camera. The rest was 35 millimeter. And once they figured out they could do that with that one scene, they were like, okay, we'll do the right. next one. And then that's when digital cinema just took off. Yeah. And, and... One of the things he was frustrated with with the new trilogy was they didn't advance technology in any kind of way. Yeah. Um, and then he's very involved with the Mandalorian because wraparound sets, yeah, digital yeah. sets, the digital cameras. It is advancing technology, which is and, and which is and cinema, which is what drives George yeah, yeah. as a person. Yeah. And uh, because, you know, they, they the effects didn't exist in 77. They had to come up with Lucasfilm yeah. or ILM, Industrial Light Magic, and come up with the, you know, motion control cameras. So they could do passes multiple times against screens. Like those things, those are benchmarks. Yeah. Every single time they made a movie, they just did something else. And um, it's just amazing. Uh, 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 on a side note, uh, you know, I I met George Lucas in the 90s. Um, on uh, a movie called Radio Land Murders, oh, yeah. which was uh, shot in Wilmington, North Carolina. And Mel Smith was the director, and his green card had expired, so he had to go back overseas. So there was some second unit stuff and stuff laying around that needed to be shot, and George Lucas was executive producer. It was a Lucasfilm movie. And uh, he came down and shot the second unit stuff. Didn't take credit and everything, but he came down. He was there. And um, Craig Edwards was a... Um, uh, a, uh, a set PA at the time, a key set PA, and he was shuffling in background. This was in the 90s when I, I was, sometimes I would do background yeah, yeah. work. And I got to get in and see George Lucas. Uh, I was in a scene, and um, and in between setups, I, uh, I walked up to him and I said, George, I said, I just wanted you to know, uh, you, you know, if you have a minute. And he was like, sure. And he was just so nice. And I said, I just wanted you to know that you're the reason I was in this business you know, as an actor and, and all that. And he just looked at me and he was like, thank you. And uh, and then I went back to my position and never bothered him yeah, the whole yeah. time. Uh, and it was funny because like that was about eight hours into a 12 hour day. And, um, but my, uh, my, and, and I had all this stuff rehearsed in my head that I was going to say to him. <laughs> and I finally got a chance to talk to him and all of it went out the window and I drew a blank face and was just like, ah, you're the reason I'm in this business. Thank you very much. You know, it was like one of those <laughs> yeah. moments, but in George, you know, it's funny as a little kid, you know, you see him on TV and all this kind of stuff. And then I'm taller than, you know, George is not very tall. And so I was taller than him and it was just an, an, uh, an amazing experience. But my point was, they had just done Indiana Jones, the 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 Indiana Jones Chronicles, mm. 
And then they did this this movie, Radio Land Murders. And what they were trying to do, they did it was the first time they ever did set extensions digitally for television. Hmm. So they would build a set, and then everything above eight feet, they would digitally figure out how to do. And so Radio Land Murders was like an experiment. It was a film. It was a comedy. Right. A murder mystery thing. But in the end, it was an experiment to push some technology that right. had not been used before. And that is really what George has always been about and uh, should get credit for just about every single movie that's ever existed post uh, 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 1977 Star Wars for visually because he pushed the entire industry to go in a direction that's never been gone in before. And, and we still evolve from it. Everybody owes George Lucas a huge, oh, yeah. you know, debt of gratitude. Yeah, the technology, no not, uh, yeah, Star Wars alone, uh, outside of Star Wars, just like you said, pushing yeah. technology THX forward. THX Sound. Yeah. I mean, Pixar, you, know, you, you name it. Pixar came you, from them. You, yeah. You, yeah, you name it. His thumbprint is on it in some capacity. Obviously, he hires the people to do the jobs. Yeah. But he comes in. He always, anyway, enough about George. Uh, love the guy. Um, uh, but uh, there's some crazy things going on. Uh, Amazon. There's rumors that Amazon might be buying AMC. That's crazy. I. I don't know how I feel about that. Like, because I know there's this thing where I guess it happened a long time ago where they made it so the distributors couldn't own the theaters. Like, cause that was a thing. So you couldn't kind of lock it down where you own the whole cycle. And so I wonder, I feel like that since they have Amazon, you know, video or prime video or whatever it is and how they do produce a lot of movies for Amazon. Like, I feel like they're kind of, I don't know if that's legal or I don't even know if that was, if it's a law or just well, look at it. Like, did. look at it, look at it like this. Amazon can put out, first of all, instead of just dropping movies on Amazon prime, in order to be an Oscar contender, right. Golden Globe, you have to have a theatrical release. Right. So if you own one of the largest theater chains in the country, you can put it on all the screens. Oh yeah. For a limited amount of time, and then, and 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 a lot of times there's this big cheat in the industry where they'll they'll shoot a movie for Netflix and then they'll just release like it like in two. New York and yeah. LA. <laughs> right, right. New York, LA, three or four, ten cinemas. They'll rent ten, ten out, and then it drops. And, uh, but this is a way for Amazon if they really do it. Now it's rumor right now. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. speculating, but, but if anybody's got the, the deep pockets to do it, it's Jeff Bezos because he's the wealthiest guy on the planet. You know, his company's over a trillion dollars worth of worth or more than that. I mean, the guy's just, it's, and then with the COVID 19 crisis, he's making money hand over fist because people are doing nothing but ordering shit and sending it to their house. Yeah. I mean, um, I, so the- if anybody's got the money to do it, it's him. Well, the one benefit I do see of Amazon owning AMC is I don't think that chain would ever go out of business because it would have Amazon because, you know, since Amazon clearly has other things that they can sort of let that weather the storm in a way. So because they're talking about AMC might actually have to declare bankruptcy because of all this. So if. Yeah, but declaring bankruptcy is just like all they're going to do is reorganize their debt, right? Because they 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 bought Carmike Cinemas, they absorbed twelve hundred screens there, um, all throughout the southeast, and they've been remodeling them and uh, over the last five or six years, taking out construction loans and remodeling those. So, if anything, they're going to restructure their debt. But if Amazon came in and bought them up, think about this: like right now, you could go to Kohl's and drop off an Amazon package. Yeah, I love that. Which I've done for yeah, you. Yeah, I've yeah. sent you something. Yeah. That 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 we ordered, and dropped it at the Coles. Well, now you've got three thousand locations across the country, cinemas where you can put an Amazon box, and if people come to see a movie, they can drop their Amazon package off at that. I mean, if you, th- I know it sounds hokey, yeah. but we we're already being, um, uh, what's the word, uh. Groomed, yeah, trained or sen- desensitized trained to it. <laughs> to to uh, to do this now as consumers, right? We buy something we don't like it online. Go to Kohl's, drop it off. Right, goes back. We get our credit. We go buy something else. Whatever the case, we're being groomed that this is the new normal, and they see it. They totally see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I can see that, but I also think if they, even if they had to restructure their debt, I'm almost certain they'd have to lose some of their theaters to like reorg. Nah. 
They, you don't think other no. companies would buy their no. cinemas? No. No way. Because if a normal person just... goes bankrupt, they have to sell their house to like pay for debt and stuff like that. So... No, no, that's that's if I mean there's different chapters. So you just chapter thirteen is is reorganization where you don't lose any of your property. Right. Chapter eleven is complete liquidation. Right. So you lose everything, you walk away with what's you know, your pockets turned inside out, and that's it. Well. Wow. So chapter thirteen, they could reorganize, structure the loans start paying them at a different lower rate or at a longer term and keep all their property. Yeah. Yeah. They can do it. They can do it. They're, they're not going anywhere, but I could see Amazon jumping on board that thing. Yeah. I mean, I think the only issue then is the legal issue if they can do that, because if that thing still exists where a distributor can't also be the exposition expositioner, Exhibitor. Yeah, exhibitor. Exhibitor. Then yeah. that, because I, I feel like that's a law. I, th- I thought I remember reading about that. There's a law where that's why everything's been laws, broken up. Laws change. Well, yeah. Laws change. Yeah. The, the, I mean, that's sort of yeah. like what I mean, happened I, with the AT&T back in the, what was the 70s or 80s when they broke it up into the baby bells. You had Southern Bell, yeah. uh, Atlantic Bell. Southern and all. Bell, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, they'll yeah. If it's too big, they'll bust it up. But that's, that's just like the T one thousand. They break it up and then it reforms back together. <laughs> and speaking of reforms back together, CBS, Viacom, Paramount are now back together. Like Viacom and CBS are back together right. after they split. Um, and they're you know starting up their their rebranding CBS All Access later on this summer. It's going to be something new. So they've got the Paramount Library. Um. Everything for CBS, Star Trek. What you had something you want to say about Star Trek? Oh no, I was. It's just funny because I just happened to be uh, watching uh, during the lockdown. I've been watching Next Generation all over again because I haven't really watched the greatest it. series. Yeah, well, cause I, ever the Star Trek. I series. watched it when it initially aired in the ni- late eighties and early nineties, and there was definitely episodes I missed during that. So it's been nice kind of catching up and really. Uh, seeing things you know as an adult and appreciating appreciating it more but i have to say there was something i watched it was episode or season five episode 25 and it was called the i think the inner light and it's the one where picard gets scanned by this probe and he wakes up in this other place and he has like a wife and then meanwhile he's knocked out on the bridge and every time they cut back like they you see him at like and it's like every time they cut they cut away from him. They go to the bridge of the Enterprise where he's passed out. And then when they go back to him, it's like a five-year jump. And he's older and he's got kids. And then, right, right. And then what you realize by the end, that the uh, and he learns to play the flute. Like that was a big thing in it. And then he can still play it yeah. when he comes back. But the thing that got me that was really amazing was I noticed when there's a scene, like the third time we see him when he's older and his kids are grown up, his son is playing the flute. And the theme he is playing is the theme for Picard. And I was like, oh, my God, that is amazing that they literally pulled that from that episode and built the theme for Picard off of that uh, flute. And I was like, that's next level stuff right there, man. I love that. (laughs) I mean, it seems obvious. Believe it or not. Well, believe it or not, they have pilfered a lot of the next generation stuff and peppered it all throughout. Yeah. Um, You know, down to, you know. Data, you know, there were references about data, you know, all his memories being right. able to be in one positronic, you know, thing. And so, and then they're using that. And so you got to hand it to him, even though if it's not the Picard is not like, it's not the next generation. It's not, you know, they've, they've broken a lot of rules. You know, me, man, yeah. I've talked about this before with all the F bombs and stuff that they drop. It's like they, that was a dead language. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't, they stop, they don't curse anymore, you know, like, you know, uh, going back to the uh, the original Enterprise crew in Star Trek: uh, The Voyage Home, but they did they pilfered a lot yeah. for that, um, and so there's a lot of nuggets. There's some really great genius guys out there uh, in the Star Trek world that have YouTube channels that have covered the Easter eggs and these things. Yeah, and you'll get lost going down a rabbit hole watching some of these because they're like you know 30 minutes long and you're just like oh my god they did that yeah i didn't know and then you want to go back and watch picard again and be like oh my god they did do that and so and there's a lot of theories out there that like um you know the uh, the one you know brother that's lore. still alive or, is lore oh, yeah, yeah. Like the, the doctor 
he, oh, he kept yeah, evolving yeah. until he got to a point where he looks like the physical form. And, and, and you'll find out later on in Picard season you know, two or whatever, that it is lore and he'll right. turn bad or, or maybe he won't, maybe he'll just be like, this is what I always wanted was my own place where I could control life forms and everything. I don't know. Uh, because he did get lost in space. I think they had jettisoned right. him. In, yeah. In one well, of he them. came uh, back and then ran away when, yeah, there's, I am not finished with it yeah. yet. Uh, the again, but yeah, there's a lot to cover there, but, but no, I mean, it's but going back to CBS all access, like rebranding themselves um, and relaunching. I mean, who's going to pay for it? Who's going to, I mean, I don't pay for it now. Like, I mean, I did the 30 day free thing and I mean, there's just not enough content on there for me to be like, I got to have CBS, you know, but maybe with the Paramount library, but they're the, what top gun and a couple other Paramount movies well, that are like something we want. Here's the see. problem. Like they, if they're going to do these short eight episode or 10 episode seasons, they need to have more shows to pick up the slack because, uh, Star Trek was usually like 24 to 26 episodes a season like you know so you had tons of con and like those shows like even watching them now they hold up really well as far as story even since they updated the vfx with the models and stuff with the next generation yeah they, they, and the original star trek they did that too when they went to blu-ray right. they redid all the visual effects so i mean the only which i think is the great. only thing that's hokey is like some of the appliances on people and stuff like clearly because the show was trying to do a lot in a short amount of time but i mean that's what was great about it. It was like always on through the year. You always had Star Trek and it was always like a really yeah. good episode. Usually at the end, it was like, wow, that was good, you know, or you felt good after the end of it. And I feel like the problem with Picard is, and the problem with Star Trek right now is they're doing these like high budget, you know, like really great movie quality stuff, but you're getting eight to 10 episodes out of it. And that's sort of a bummer. So it's like for them, like really the only reason I even have CBS right now, well, I had I'm getting ready to get rid of it as soon as Survivor ends cuz my <laughs> life or my wife loves Survivor, but really the only reason I even got it in the first place was for Picard and you know, Discovery when uh it was on. But like they have year gaps between shows, so it's like you are not giving me a reason to stick around. So if you're going to have these really short seasons, they should have four or five Star Trek shows like a year. So there's one at least. Right. But you have to you have to fund those. And well, right then they now, shouldn't the do them Viacom so high budget and Paramount and everything coming back together. They were struggling financially. I mean, yeah. and the, and and they were having the problems because they couldn't merchandise off. The, the the Star Trek content because Paramount owned the merchandising rights. And oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, you never got any new action figures. You right. never got any new anything. So for all these new seasons that they've been um, putting out for Discovery and all that, they have no ancillary funds coming in. No pinball machines, wow. no video games, no action figures, no comic books. They can't do shit because they didn't own any of the, the rights. So now that Paramount's back in the fold, mm -hmm. there's a chance they we're going to start seeing some ancillary revenue being made by them by putting out stuff for the fans to do. But right now, like th those shows are not making any money for CBS. They are bankrupting CBS. Well, and also like they should, they should have at least one Star Trek show. That's sort of like the Orville, which the Orville is essentially. So clearly that show can pull it off on budget and not get crazy with making it like a movie. I mean, it's, it really is like they copied the next gen model. And I even, heard uh seth mcfarlane talking that they even hired directors from next generation and the lighting people so they could light the sets to be exactly like the next generation because clearly i'm sure he has he grew up loving the next gen and this is sort of like his you of know of course or star trek in general all the right. way back like us and because he's older than us he, he would have liked the old stuff in syndication right so i feel like and so that's proof it can be done like why cbs doesn't have at least one new show that's sort of like that. That's, you know, monster of the week kind of thing. What's the new thing of the week? Because watching it now, like I do love serialized stuff. I like following one long thread and I enjoy that, you know, and Netflix, now in streaming, it's gotten even better. But I think shows like Star Trek work really well as, as monster of the week. When there's self-contained stories in each yeah, episode. Yeah, because some of them are really good, like that. You would have never gotten that episode I just watched, the Inner Light episode, if they were doing one long arc. It allows you to have like give characters episodes 
So you get to flesh out characters more. Flesh out characters. And right, so, right. and they're all usually, you know, they might explore some da- dark areas occasionally, but usually it's kind of like, you know, a little bit like what uh, Dave Filoni said in the Star Trek thing. It's like, give these kids hope because that's what they need, you know? Talking about that was like the message George Lucas gave everyone. Kind of same with Star Trek. Is it? Star Trek should be hopeful. Like, this is what we can aspire to, to be like these people that have, you know, worked through all these stupid you know, things that get us in trouble in this world that we live in now. So it's like, that's sort of what was the beauty of Star Trek. It was hope. Like, one day we'll get there, you know, or at least you can aspire to be like that character or, you know. And I do think people need to see that. And, like, right now you don't have any of that because all the Star Trek stuff, while they're fun to watch, it isn't hopeful. It's all... And they're, I think, getting too mired in politics happening in the real world because Patrick Stewart pretty much said... Brexit and all this other stuff influenced the show, and right, and right. I feel like this is an instance where. But I th- I think I think like like people wanted to escape to a reality, right. that is a utopia where there is no money. You don't have to worry about money. You could do right. a job because you like to do the job, and you join Starfleet because there's a higher calling. Right, and all this kind of stuff, and they basically pissed on all of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's a shame that they did that because we need. We don't need more of everything that's around us now. Right. We need escapism, and that's what television provides is escapism. Right, and it's— or, or the cinema. Yeah, movies and TV have always been escape. That's why, like, during hard times, liquor, movies, and what is it? Uh, pornography always do really well because— Always do well during depression. Right, because those are your basic yeah. instincts, essentially. You're like, you know, your baser level stuff where, you know, obviously people— procreate or whatever and so you got that yeah and then you know same with like uh liquor helps you get through it and entertainment and entertainment like that's why i don't think where people are injecting so much politics i don't know if they think they're doing it a good thing by touching on these topics but what they're really doing and i think the resistance that everyone's feeling isn't racist bigots pushing back it's people that are i'm trying to escape right now and you're putting everything i see already into it so where am i supposed to escape to now like because it's everywhere it's like it's you can put politics in to something and do it tastefully like the original star wars movie was really an anti-vietnam war era kind of film star trek was you didn't get that vibe you didn't get that vibe coming out of it yeah you know, and Star Trek two, Star Trek was as well because they were like a utopia. We well, don't they do also things anymore. Where like we talked you know, about they broke barriers with with well, yeah, interracial like, couples and stuff like that. But they like again, like what we talked about in another on a last podcast was how they were able to tackle stories that you really couldn't tackle. You know, well, for especially the original Star Trek, you couldn't tell them at that time on t- TV period. But they mask it in such a way where you remove right. your own perception off of it you know like how you see the world and you see it through another perspective when you completely take the human element out of it and just introduce aliens then you can see but when you make but when you make a story now and go this right you know is a gay person or this is an interracial couple or that without it being like two alien species together and how it's harmony you know it's like oh wait i get what they're trying to say but they're not they're not blatantly like shoving it. Well, yeah, down it's not so throats, obvious. Which I, that, that's where I, that's where I think like you drop nuggets, yeah, to get your point across. If that's what you're trying to do with a yeah. story, but you don't have to spoon feed it to everybody. Yeah. And I think that's why certain things are backfiring. And speaking of backfiring, I want to pivot towards um, a couple of things. Like the Winter Soldier, uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is back up and running again. They're going to be going. Uh, they finished their Atlanta leg a while back before the COVID-19 break. And then now they're going to go to the Czech Republic and start filming in the Czech Republic. Yeah. And they've got these protocols now where they, you know, they, they get on a plane in in the U S they get the temperature taken when they land, they get the temperature taken and they're in quarantine for three days before they can come to set. And so they've got all this stuff planned out. And then, you know, you, so they're on schedule uh, where they took their break, but then you're hearing stuff from James Cameron with avatar two that, um, uh, you know, they're, they're months behind now because they were supposed to go film in New Zealand to do the live action stuff. They've been doing all the CGI stuff. 
and they got a lot of filming to do because you know he's filming a bunch of movies all at one time. Right. Uh, and, and I had heard that the price tag is a billion dollars, two hundred fifty million per film they're spending, but it's monetized out over so many years. Right. So they are, but they've committed a billion dollars to the Avatar franchise. But he's pissed, and you know James can't do. James gets mad. Cameron is a tyrant. Oh yeah. On set, he'll take a camera off your shoulder. If you're not getting the shot right, he'll flip out on people. But that's because yeah. he's a pro- project perfectionist. But uh, And most people that work with him love working for him. But then after the show, you hear he was a complete nightmare. Yeah, yeah. But yet, they they want to work with him because they want the accolades. Right. They want to be able to say they work good shit. with James Cameron. Yeah. Make, makes good shit. Uh, but he's a nightmare um, from what people say. So they're behind on the Avatar films. And that's a big gamble because, you know, that's been absorbed when the 20th Century Fox was bought by Disney. That's been absorbed. All the Avatars are now under the mouse house. So it'll be interesting to see how that that washes out. Did we talk about Swamp Thing and the CW Network and all the DC Cinematic Universe stuff? Did we? I don't know. I don't know if we did or not. No, well, Swamp Thing is now going to be on the CW Network. So they're going to edit it for television. Uh, because it's pretty graphic and scary. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it was on the DC Cinematic Universe. Stargirl was supposed to be exclusively DC Universe. But back when Swamp Thing was canceled, my wife was a producer's assistant on that. Um, there were rumors all on set that the DC Cinematic Universe was, <clears throat> the app was going bye-bye because HBO Max was coming down the pipe. Right. And... It would. It was just absorbing all this cash flow and everything. Is one of the reasons why, um, possibly, that the show got canceled. J.J. Abrams got his five hundred million dollar deal um, to produce content. He wants to do the dark Justice League dark, so he wants control of Swamp Thing. And it was, you know, it was in the other, the other house there, um, uh, who was producing that. So a lot going on, but it's interesting to see that, like, you know, I'm assuming once. Disney or HBO Max, what doesn't that isn't that May twenty seventh? Isn't that when it goes? Yeah, I live? think so. I think it was May twenty seventh. Yeah, so it's gonna go live. It'll have all this content, and I'm wondering if it'll look anything like Disney Plus, where it'll have the icons of you know Pixar, Star Wars, so on, so on, and Marvel. So you can click right on the tab and go where yeah. you want to go. I'm assuming it'll look like that, and it would make so much sense for them to just put a DC app or a DC clickable icon just like marvel is on disney plus on hbo max and just get rid of dc universe because it did not raise the money especially when they spent 83 million dollars making the 10 episodes of swamp thing it's supposed to go to 13 they cut that shit short because they were running out of money they knew the show was going to get canceled yeah they rewrote the last episode to kind of close it off now they're going to edit that for television and air it on the cw network I don't know how you're going to uh, do that. Because, because they need ad revenue. Right. They need to make up some ground of the $80 million loss. And I think someone's like, well, let's put it on CW. Then once it runs its its course there and brings in all the ad revenue that we're going to get from selling, you know, you know, Ford trucks will, you know, be pulling swamp logs out of the water, running those kind of commercials in between the breaks. We'll put the... the uh, the rated R version on HBO Max. Yeah. In the DC tab. Yeah, because it's weird. Like that would be a weird one to throw on the CW, especially how this what the CW has turned into lately. Where it doesn't seem like maybe back when Arrow season one came out, I could see it. But they've gotten so far away from that now that it's just even edit because I saw the pilot for Swamp Thing and it was like graphic. graphic like when he's tearing his head off. Like when he gets you know, out of the could, swamp, they could also show it at ten o'clock at night and put a viewer discretion yeah. advised thing on but it. They're, you know, yeah, yeah. It's just weird. It's and weird. Remember, it's the just... CW network is cable. It's not one of the big three. It's not NBC, CBS, ABC. Yeah. It, it it can it can get loose with the lips and the cursing if it wanted to. But that's just not it the. Just has to pay a couple of fines. That just is not what they've been doing. Like so, that's what I'm saying. It's just so weird because it's not. They've sort of become like the unofficial DC television show network. Right. But I just don't I it's so dark. I just don't see that. I don't but I then, get what you're saying. Then, you if know, they're just it's but a then money when you, play. When you looked at the when you looked at the the last DC crossover of, event, they had a clip of Swamp Thing. 
in there. Mm, yeah, well, they did in the last episode. Everything they did the Titans, and then they yeah they showed everything. Yeah. They showed Titans. They showed they showed uh, the the Doom Patrol. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when Swamp Thing was getting canceled, they were saying that they were going to retool Doom Patrol and retool Star Girl to go straight to the CW network. And everyone was like, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. That's It's all good. No, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, Stargirl is going to premiere at the exact same time. It drops. It'll be on the CW network, and it'll be on hmm. the DC Cinematic Universe app. Or the DC Universe is what it's called. So it'll be, bo- uh, simultaneously, it'll be both on those apps. But it makes no sense. Like, I think there's going to be some serious restructuring that's going to go on yeah. in May sometime in May or June and one will absorb the other. Maybe they'll give all the people that have been paying for um, the DC universe app, a free two years of HBO max yeah. because they've paid the $79 for the full year. You know, if they were, if they bought it up front and then you're going to give them two years. So they're going to get DC content and they're going to get everything else. They'll get friends. They'll get all the HBO right. stuff. They'll get all this stuff. It's like, it's a no brainer to just give that to them and say, bye bye with the DC app. But I think that's, what's going to go down, but it's interesting to see how they're going to try to make money. They're going to, it's based, they're double dipping. They want the ad revenue yeah, yeah, and then they want it streaming. Yeah. I mean, I, it's interesting. I, I I think you're right. I think that's obviously what they're going to be doing is they they want the ad money and because it seems like whatever whoever made those decisions with the DC universe and those four or three or four shows or whatever they clearly had a changeover and now like that's not the direction we're going in now. But we already have these properties in development, so we're just going to let them run their course. But I do feel like they should be looking at HBO Max as a Disney Plus and have like you're saying a section dedicated to DC and really just start yeah. cranking out uh DC series. Like get that shit away from the CW, please. It's just ruining all like cool characters. It's a money maker for them though, man. Is it's, it? The CW loves that. It's, it's yeah. but they're each. Well, uh, but you, but you, you, you follow the ratings. So, well, I was tracking all the ratings and pretty much almost all of the, of the CW shows have started declining. Like, Right around 2016, every one of their shows have just started like free falling. Like they've been dramatically going down. And that's the thing I don't get. I don't understand how CW could be consistently losing uh, revenue or ad revenue, I imagine, if their, you know, viewership is just declining. Like, why is no one riding the ship? Why is anyone like, wow, this direction we went in really isn't making us money? So how about we go back to what that was getting us? Because when Arrow season one and two those were really do- well ratings and then flash came out that had like the biggest ratings of the cw and then you had one or two great seasons of that and then it just started falling off as we talked about last time the when they started turning it into an ensemble i feel like is really when the show started taking a nosedive um even supergirl's got a bunch of friends now it's not just her yeah no it's you know and it's like wait a minute focus on just supergirl yeah. You know, why are, why are you got, why are these sidekicks with capes yeah, and shit yeah. that weren't, yeah. That's, so yeah. I think we need to go back to focus on the character and let them be the star of the show and let everyone. You want to see some, you want to see some ratings go through the roof? Batman. You put, you put Batwoman. Oh yeah. On HBO Max, mm-hmm. right? Go hard R with it, with girl on girl actions topless everything that goes Dude. against everything that they're doing right now though like <laughs> it it, do- <laughs> it doesn't matter it, it it'll go through the roof you don't even need it, to do that because just do a good batman show your ratings will go through the roof because we've all wanted one well, Not- but you know now that they've got they've got you know uh pattinson you know doing batman on the big screen they're never going to do a tv show for batman ever again it's, it's never just, I, they the closest we ever got was titans see, doing the little Bruce Wayne shit and the nuggets with the fake CGI Batmobile in the one scene. But the thing that the flash has proved that you can have a show that's successful and a movie, you know, going on. Granted the movie wasn't so successful, but I, I think that was other decisions. Like, I think if the movie was done well, you could have had two worlds. And I do think 
You're talking about the Flash, which movie? The well, like the the Flash and Bat or the Justice League movie with the Flash. Oh, Justice League. So movie. it's like yeah, yeah, with you know Flash. you can have a a movie version and a TV version, and I do think the smart play for DC would be to keep the universes separate, keep a movie universe and then keep a TV universe, because I do think that's sort of the problem with Marvel is that. I mean, it seems like they're going to put the resources behind it to do it right on Disney Plus, but I wish, I really wish they would separate it because I would love to see an Iron Man television show or a Captain America television show or any of these great characters. I'd love to see TV shows right. with them, but they're gone now. We had like a handful of great movies with them, but they're gone. So it's like, whereas if they would have kept it separate, you could have had a whole universe on TV. And a whole universe in the movies. And I feel like DC would be smart to just embrace the streaming world as one universe and then the film universe as something different, you know? Because then you could ha try different things out and then you could always do Crisis as a film if you wanted to merge them all together, but I I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. 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 We, we, John Cryer is a good Lex Luthor, though. Yeah, I liked Michael Rosenbaum. I... I I liked on Smallville. Well, yeah. just because that to me was the first time I saw Luther not be campy, like uh, in in right. And I've I'm a big Gene Hackman fan. That's my and that's my. I loved it too because I mean we grew up watching you know the Christopher Reeves Superman, and that was my introduction to Superman. You know was Christopher Reeves, and I love those yeah. like especially the first movie and the Donner cut of the second one, but um, like it's just yeah, man, it's just. The campiness worked for that, but once it, like that's what I liked about Michael Rosenbaum's performance or character in that was he wasn't a joke because Luther was kind of a joke. He was kind of comic relief, you know. He'd have his grand speeches and like ah, and it was really just a right. you know a campy villain. Whereas the character they wrote on Smallville was definitely always two steps ahead of you. And I they would always have this thing where you're like, oh, Lex is going to get screwed. And then he'd have this, always have this great monologue in the last act of the show where he'd basically like, yeah, when you thought you were getting me, I've already gotten one that was ahead of you and did all this, and now you're going to jail or you're going to die. You know, it's like, that's how Lex Luthor should be. Always one step ahead. It's good writing. Yeah, well. What happened? What happened with all the writers on the CW for all those superhero movies? Or TV shows. What happened uh, to them? I don't know. Where'd they go? <laughs> not not they on even the shows. Writing anymore? The people that were on Smallville? I don't know. I mean, in the later seasons of Smallville, they were phoning it in because they ran out of stuff. I mean, again, they did every almost major Superman storyline in the show before he was Superman. So I think they were just kind of checked yeah. out in the end. But they did have some cool stuff. That's the same thing with the Arrow. They did every. Batman storyline ever with Arrow so that, you know, all because Batman was over on Gotham. Right. So And dumb. you couldn't use, you know, Ra's al Ghul and all that. I mean, what a mess. What a mess that yeah. was. You know, when when Arrow went and trained with Ra's al Ghul and all that stuff. I mean, it's just, they just took all the characters and muddied it all up. Yeah. No, no wonder Steve Amell was having a nervous breakdown and... <laughs> Towards the end there, you know? Uh, that's tough stuff. Uh, we covered a lot. Yeah. And there's so much going on. It's, dude, it's like lately everything, like so much is dropping every day. It's hard to even keep up uh, by the time we get to our podcast. But um, And it's weird. You know, Tom Cruise in space. That's, well, it's weird that's considering. That's the only thing I can take away. Yeah. Tom Cruise in space. Tom Cruise in space. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, weird though <laughs> with everything going on. It's surprising that there is so much news coming out i guess because they've got a lot of time to figure out their plans now since they're not in production on stuff right now so well and hopefully you know the show that i was working on will be back into production soon i i think the studio where i'm at you know we, we can support like three or four shows on the lot but then you know we got about three or four crews deep you know that we can pull from and i we're gonna bounce back pretty good i think when the industry gets back and run and it's going to be because right because come september everyone's out of original content yeah. although i saw that the mandalorian they said will be finished on time by october season two to drop by october but most of the major networks they got yeah. nothing new they have nothing yeah it's going to be so see usually like when i work on a series you'll get six episodes in shooting mm -hmm. 
And those six will have already been in post and their directors were looking at their cuts and doing the editing room and all that kind of stuff. Then they'll start when September hits, you'll, you'll have six episodes that will air over six weeks right. before it catches up to you in production. Right, yeah. So you got six weeks of running to knock out every, and this, so then it's this daisy chain of trying right. to catch up to you. So, but we don't have that leg time anymore. I honestly, we don't have it. And, 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 and that's where it's, it's like the seasons, there's no more seasons. Yeah. It's like when a show drops, it drops. Right. And it, it'll either be a mid season. It'll be, they'll, they'll do four or five episodes and take a break from that, put in something else and try a new show. There's, there's no format. It used to be 20, you know, you'd get your 12 episodes, get they get the back yeah, nine, yeah. 21 episodes. You'd get a season. If you did well, the first 12, they give you the back nine. Now, nothing like yeah. that. It's like six episodes, 10 episodes, five episodes, 13 episodes. So weird. Limited series. Like right now I'm watching this really good show with Chris Evans. Um, uh, uh, defending Jacob. Oh yeah. It's based on a book. It's on, uh, Apple TV. Yep. It's really good. If you haven't seen it, the thing is if you, if you buy an Apple product, yeah. iPad, iPhone, iPad, everything you get Apple TV f- for a year. Yeah, free. I got it. So if you just bought an iPhone, yep. yeah, you should check out defending yeah, yeah. Jacob. It's a really, really good show. And, um, and Michelle Dockery's in it too. And I did two seasons of good behavior with Michelle Dockery. Mm. Um, and she was great. Uh, to the crew on that show she's awesome awesome uh, person uh, actress and so um both in front of and behind the, you know the camera yeah and um so yeah i mean there's really good content coming out on on apple but then like apple's gonna run out of oh, shit yeah. too well I've, like everyone's running out of stuff i feel like what if if especially if we get a second wave a real bad second wave with all this like i feel like reality tv is going to be a big thing because you remember like i think with one of the writer strikes when one of them happened all you saw was reality tv because they couldn't make anything yeah Yeah. and then that's why the next time around they were like no realities you got to add those writers in with us (laughs) when the writer strike happened yeah Yeah. because they're producing because all reality tv is fake it's all it's it's so they make it all up they have writers i worked on a um, swamp thing for the discovery channel Mm -hmm. and there was a field producer and they were you know, yeah, kind of writing a linear path for each episode, and then they would do things to where they would make people fight, yeah, yeah. and and cause things like a flat tire on a vehicle. That no, there was no flat right. tire, but let's let the air out and and write it in that the how would you react? Don't tell the, right, yeah, the yeah. business owner the tire's flat, and then watch him flip out. And it's all bullshit. It's all dude. produced. All reality. Yeah. The only thing that's not produced which is the longest tele- reality TV show in the history of mankind is cops. Oh yeah. yeah. That's the only show that is not, yeah, yeah. not written, yeah. but every reality TV show on the planet has writers and they write it or they have a field producer that right. writes as they go. And it's all fake. Yeah. yeah. All of it. And they make the story in the edit team room mom. A lot of the, time. the only thing real about team mom is when they, the girls knocked up. That's yeah, the yeah. real life. And the girl has a baby. <laughs> yeah. Everything else, the eh, Octo produced. Mom, all these people. It's produced. It's produced. Yeah, yeah. It's all bullshit. So I feel like scenarios. Oh. Yeah, okay. Never mind. No, I'm, I'm just I'm saying rambling. I feel like that's where I feel like that's where they're gonna go probably in the fall. We'll see a ton of reality television. While the But how can you well, all right, so a reality TV show, when I worked on Swamp Thing, we had two camera operators and two assistants. Or I, uh, that would um, uh, take the tapes, yeah, log yeah. them for them to be FedExed. You had one field producer and like one other like writer, logistics person, or so you had a team of less than ten. Yeah. Now a feature film or a television show that I normally work on is like two hundred crew members. Right. Yeah. Well, I was on. I did an episode so, of Bridezilla when, uh, and I had to go down to Myrtle Beach. Uh, you worked on. You did yeah. work on yeah. Bridezilla. So I was a cameraman. Uh, uh, Dude. They had a field producer, or they had a, a field producer cameraman following them for the week, or, or like with them for the first week leading up to the wedding. And then I was there for the weekend, and I was covering the groom the whole time. So, Didn't you tell me that things were going too well, and they asked for P? They, I remember you telling well, me we were roommates years and years and years ago, and you told me I remember that you were like, man. The wedding was going so well, and the producers had to pull the bride over and go like, "Hey, this well, you got to do it something was is, crazy, or you know." Because I, our bride was a legit 
bridezilla. Like she was like, I, I remember I was in the room with the groom while he was getting ready. And I just want to be like, dude, what are you doing, man? <laughs> like run, <laughs> run this late. You know what? It would be interesting to see if they're still. Yeah. Together. I don't know. But uh, he was a Marine. So it was like, Oh, no, <laughs> yeah. that's a divorce. already. But, um, but yeah, like, so it was funny. So I was talking to the producer that came down that was like with us and I had, we had a PA with us to hand our tapes off to and stuff, but we had a field producer kind of with us. So you had the main field producer cameraman that was with the bride most of the time. And then we were kind of like, I was brought in for the, a day or two before. And then on the day of the wedding, there was more cameramen brought in to cover the wedding. But the the producer, I remember we were at lunch and I was asking her, I was like, so are these, are they always bridezillas? And she's like, no, she's like, half of them are really just sweet people, but we're like, Hey, we need you to amp it up. So, and then they'll act like a crazy bitch oh. and they, and they, cause for them it's fun. Cause their friends know that's not them in real life. And so for them, it's right. like this big joke, like, ah, I see how I was acting like a bitch in that. Like, and so it's it's all like half of it's fake. So basically if it's a, the bride is not a bridezilla, they ask them to be a bridezilla, you know, and then some are just legit bridezillas. So, you know, it's funny. All right. So I'll, you, you told a little secret about the industry there. I'll tell it. All right. So on swamp thing for discovery channel is a father and son that like, like they're loggers uh-huh. and uh, yeah, everything's going fine. And so, this piece of equipment breaks and they told the son not to tell the father that the piece of equipment broke. Now the father and son are tight. I mean, they are good people. And for him to like lie to his dad, just so the dad could roll up and see the equipment broken and flip out was like, it was really like shitty to do. Right. And that's what really left a, a, a bad taste in my mouth is like, you got a, a father and son that are that absolutely love each other and work so hard for each other with this company doing this logging stuff, and then you got a Weasley fil, uh, uh, field producer that creates a situation that causes them to get upset with each right. other, and the father was it was a genuine reaction when he was like all upset, yeah. and I thought that is just shitty to do, yeah. uh, all in the name of like you know. Trashy and TV because like the D- Discovery Channel was paying them more than what they would make logging, right. you know. So it was mu- it was you know uh, financially better for them to amp it up, if you would say. But it just you know for me, watching them uh, go at each other when they normally wouldn't do it is sad. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, this sucks. This <laughs> uh, what the f- what am I doing here? I actually I ended up. Um, I got fired from that show. Oh, what? Really? Yeah, be- the, because I, I spoke my uh, mind about what was going on, and the field producer didn't like it at all. He didn't yeah. like it. And I complained. It was terrible. I mean, we were out in the in the, in the the swamp, in the muck. We were knee-deep in shit, and uh, there, there was no set medic out there. And then the other thing was, like, they, uh, they we had an ice storm that came through, and iced over everything. And we got up early at, you know, five in the morning and went all the way out to the swamp mm-hmm. and all the, all the way deep into the woods and all this And we're waiting in the cold, freezing, no fire, no um, uh, 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 sterno lamps like the, you know, or the, the propane tanks that would keep you warm for the crew. Nothing, wow. nothing. And the logging guys were like, what? We don't log in the ice. You should have checked with us first. Wow. Something like that. And I was just like, I was pissed. And I was like, you made us come all the way out here to do this. And like, you, you couldn't pick up the phone call and find out that these guys oh, weren't coming yeah, yeah. out. And we're, we're, we're 40 or 50 minutes away from home. It's 40 degrees, less than 40 degrees out. There's ice everywhere. Well, it might've been colder than that. Cause there was ice everywhere, but I was just, I was livid. Yeah. When we got back to the office, you know, they made me get all my, we had all this gear. And as soon as I got out of the gear, they were like, we don't want you anymore. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, fine. I don't want to be here either. But I knew it was coming. Right. I just, cause I really, but the guy was like, the field producer was a complete jerk yeah. on the show, you know? And, and his big claim to fame before he was a field producer was he was like a roadie just packing up, 
you know, we all come from somewhere, but this guy would, you know, would be in the van going to set and he'd tell really horrible stories about doing blow and all this kind of, I was just like, uh, this guy sucked. (laughs) I hope, I hope he never got another job in the film industry because I excelled in the film industry and I hope this guy is washing cars somewhere. Uh He's probably not because usually like assholes. They do really well in this business. They they do really well in the (laughs) film industry. So yeah, I just burned some bridges right there, but I don't care. Um, (laughs) <laughs> anyway, I'd love to find the name of that guy. I'm going to find a call sheet on that guy. I'll drop his name in the next episode. <laughs> um, but anyway, all right, look, I've had a good time. Yep. It was nice talking about the Bridezilla and stuff. Yeah. Um, that was good. I didn't expect that. And, and, and it's, that's what's cool. We can go off on tangents oh, yeah. and talk about the projects we've worked on. Um, but that was cool, man. I appreciate you shooting the shit with me tonight, Yeah, Steve. man. Oh, I guess I'll see you next time. <laughs> Okay, we hope you enjoy this episode of The Spotlight with Sean O'Rourke. Come back, check us out next week. Make sure you check the uh, description below for all of the links to the social media and how you can subscribe to this show, both audio and on YouTube. And we'll see you on the next one.